The Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, a new rendering based on the Follis translation of 1742 by George W. Crystal, published 1902. Book 3 1. Man must consider not only that each day part of his life is spent, and that less and less remains to him, but also that, even if he live longer, it is very uncertain whether his intelligence will suffice as heretofore for the understanding of his affairs, and for grasping that knowledge which aims at comprehending things human and divine. When dotage begins, breath, nourishment, fancy, impulse, and so forth will not fail him. But self-command, accurate appreciation of duty, power to scrutinize, that strikes his senses, or even to decide whether he should take his departure, all powers indeed which demand a well-trained understanding, must be extinguished in him. Let him be up and doing then, not only because death comes nearer every day, but because understanding and intelligence often leave us before we die. 2. Observe what grace and charm appear even in the accidents that accompany nature's work. Thus, some parts of a loaf crack and burst in the baking, and this cracking, though in a manner contrary to the design of the baker, looks well and invites the appetite. Figs, too, gape when at their ripest, and in ripe olives the very approach to rotting adds a special beauty to the fruit. The droop of ears of corn, the bent brows of the lion, the foam at a boar's mouth, and many other things are far from comely in themselves. Yet, since they accompany the works of nature, they make part of her adornment, and rejoice the beholder. Thus, if a man be sensitive to such things, and have more than common penetration into the constitution of the whole, scarce anything connected with nature will fail to give him pleasure, as he comes to understand it. Such a man will contemplate the real world, the fierce jaws of wild beasts, with no less delight than when sculptors or painters set forth for him their presentments. With like pleasure will his chaste eyes behold the maturity and grace of old age and man or woman, and the inviting charms of youth. Many such things will strike him, things not credible to the many, but which come to him alone who is truly familiar with the works of nature and near to her own heart. 3. Hippocrates, who had healed many diseases, himself fell sick and died. The Chaldeans foretold the fatal hours of multitudes, and afterwards fate carried themselves away. Alexander, Pompey, and Gaius Caesar, who so often raised whole cities and cut off in battle so many myriads of horse and foot, at last departed from this life themselves. Heraclitus, after his many speculations on the conflagration of the world, died swollen with water and plastered with cow dung. Vermin destroyed Democritus. Socrates was killed by vermin of another sort. What of all this? You have gone aboard, made your voyage, come to harbor. Disembark. If into another life, there will God be also. If into nothingness, at least you will have done with bearing pain and pleasure, and with your slavery to this vessel so much meaner than its slave. For the soul is intelligence and deity, the body dust and corruption. 4. Waste not what remains of life in consideration about others, when it makes not for the common good. Be sure you are neglecting other work if you busy yourself with what such a one is doing and why, with what he is saying, thinking, or scheming. All such things do but divert you from the steadfast guardianship of your own soul. It behooves you, then, in every train of thought, to shun all that is aimless or useless, and above all, everything officious or malignant. Accustom yourself so, and only so, to think that, if any one were suddenly to ask you of what you are thinking now, 
you could answer frankly and at once of so-and-so. Then it will plainly appear that you are all simplicity and kindliness, as befits a social being who takes little thought of enjoyment or any phantom pleasure, who spurns contentiousness, envy, or suspicion, or any passion the harboring of which one would blush to own. For such a man who has finally determined to be henceforth among the best is, as it were, a priest and minister of the gods, using the spirit within him which preserves a man unspotted from pleasure, unwounded by any pain, inaccessible to all insult, innocent of all evil, a champion in the noblest of all contests, the contest for victory over every passion. He is penetrated with justice. He welcomes with all his heart whatever befalls or is appointed by providence. He troubles not often, or ever without pressing public need, to consider what another may say, or do, or design. Solely intent upon his own conduct, ever mindful of his own concurrent part in the destiny of the universe, he orders his conduct well, persuaded that his part is good. For the lot appointed to every man is part of the law of all things, as well as a law for him. He forgets not that all rational beings are akin, and that the love of all mankind is part of the nature of man. Also, that we must not think as all men think, but only as those who live a life accordant with nature. As for those who live otherwise, he remembers always how they act at home and abroad, by night and by day, and how and with whom they are found in company. And so, he cannot esteem the praise of such, for they enjoy not their own approbation. 5. In action be neither grudging nor selfish, nor ill-advised, nor constrained. Let not your thought be adorned with overmuch nicety. Be not a babbler or a busybody. Let the God within direct you as a manly being, as an elder, a statesman, a Roman, and a ruler, standing prepared like one who awaits the recall from life in marching order. Require neither an oath nor the testimony of any man. And withal, be cheerful and independent of the assistance and the peace that comes from others. For it is a man's duty to stand upright, self-supporting, not supported. 6. If in the life of man you find anything better than justice, truth, sobriety, manliness, and in some anything better than the satisfaction of your soul with itself in that wherein it is given to you to follow right reason, and with fate in that which is determined beyond your control, if, I say, you find aught better than this, then turn thereto with all your heart and enjoy it as the best that is to be found." But if nothing seems to you better than the divinity seated within you, which has conquered all your impulses, which sifts all your thoughts, which, as Socrates said, has detached itself from the promptings of sense and devoted itself to God and to the love of mankind, if you find every other thing small and worthless compared with this, see that you give place to no other which might turn, divert, or distract you from holding in highest esteem the good which is especially improperly your own. For it is not permitted to us to substitute for that which is good in reason, or in fact, anything not agreeable thereto, such as the praise of the many, power, riches, or the pursuit of pleasure. All these things may seem admissible for a moment, but presently they get the upper hand and lead us astray. But do you, I say, frankly and freely, choose the best and keep to it. The best is what is your advantage. If now you choose what is for your spiritual advantage, hold it fast. If what is for your bodily advantage, admit that it is so chosen, and keep your choice with all modesty. Only see that you make a sure discrimination. 7. Never esteem aught of advantage which will oblige you to break your faith or to desert your honor, to hate, to suspect, or to execrate any man, to play a part, 
to set your mind on anything that needs to be hidden by wall or curtain. He who to all things prefers the soul, the divinity within him, and the sacred cult of its virtues, makes no tragic groan or gesture. He needs neither solitude nor a crowd of spectators, and best of all, he will live neither seeking nor shunning death. Whether the soul shall use its surrounding body for a longer or shorter space is to him indifferent. Were he to depart this moment, he would go as readily as he would do any other seemingly in proper action, holding one thing only in life, long avoidance, to find his soul in any case unbefitting an intelligent social being. 8. In the soul of the chastened and purified man, you would find nothing putrid, foul, or festering. Fate does not cut off his life before its proper end, as one would say of an actor who left the stage before his part was ended, or he had reached his appointed exit. There remains nothing servile or affected, nothing too conventional or too seclusive, nothing that fears censure or courts concealment. 9. Hold in honor the faculty which forms opinions. It depends on this faculty alone that no opinion your soul entertains be inconsistent with the nature and constitution of the rational being. It ensures that we form no rash judgments, that we are kindly to men and obedient to the gods. 10. Cast from you then all other things, retaining these few. Remember also that every man lives only this present moment, which is a fleeting instant. The rest of time is either spent or quite unknown. Short is the time which each of us has to live, and small the corner of the earth he has to live in. Short is the longest posthumous fame, and this preserved through a succession of poor mortals, soon themselves to die. Men who knew not themselves, far less those who died long ago. 11. To these maxims add this other. Accurately define or describe everything that strikes your imagination, so that you may see and distinguish what it is in naked essence, and what it is in its entirety, that you may tell yourself the proper name of the thing itself, and the names of the parts of which it is compounded, and into which it will be resolved. Nothing makes mind greater than the power to inquire into all things that present themselves in life, and, while you examine them, to consider at the same time of what fashion is the universe, and what is the function in it of these things, of what importance they are to the whole, of what to man who is a citizen of that highest city of which all other cities are but households. Consider what is this thing that now makes an impression on you, of what it is composed and how long it is destined to endure? Consider also for what virtue it calls, whether it be gentleness, courage, truthfulness, fidelity, simplicity, independence, or any other. Say, therefore, of each event, this comes from God, or... This comes from the conjunction and inner texture of the strands of fate, or from some chance or hazard of that kind. Or, this comes from one of my own tribe, from my kinsman, from my friend. He is indeed ignorant of what accords with nature, but I am not, and will therefore use him kindly and justly, according to the natural and social law. As to things indifferent, I strive to appraise them, at their proper value. 12. If you discharge your present duty with firm and zealous, yet kindly, observance of the laws of reason, if you regard no by-gains, but keep pure within your immortal part, as if obliged to restore it at once to him who gave it, if you hold to this with no further desires or aversions, and be content with the natural discharge of your present task, and with the heroic sincerity of all you say or utter, you will live well, and herein no man can hinder you. 13. As surgeons have ever their knives and instruments at hand for the sudden emergencies of their art, 
so do you keep ready the principles requisite for understanding things divine and human, and for doing all things, even the least important, in the remembrance of the bond between the two. For in neglecting this, you will scant your duty both to gods and men. 14. Cease your wandering, for you are not like to read again your own memoirs, or the deeds of the ancient Greeks and Romans, or those collections from the writings of others that you laid up for your old age. Hasten, then, to your proper end. Fling away vain hopes, and, if you have any care for yourself, fly to your own succor while yet you may. 15. Men understand not all that is signified by the words to steal, to sow, to buy, to rest, to see what is to be done. For it is not the bodily eye, but another sort of sight that must discern these things. 16. We have body, soul, and intelligence. To the body belong the senses, to the soul the passions, to the intelligence principles. To be affected by the imagery of sense belongs to the beasts of the field no less than to us. To be swayed by gusts of passion is common to us with the wild beasts, with the most effeminate wretches, with Nero and with Phalaris. Moreover, the possession of a mind to guide us to what seems fitting is shared by us, with atheists, with traitors to their country, and with such as shut their doors and sin. If, then, all the rest is common, as we have seen, there remains to the good man this special excellence, to welcome with pleasure all that happens or is ordained, not to defile the divinity enthroned in his breast, not to perturb it with a crowd of images, but to preserve it in tranquility, to obey it as a god, to observe truth in all he says and justice in his every action. And, though others may not believe that he lives thus in simplicity, modesty, and contentment, he neither takes this unbelief amiss from any one, nor quits the road which leads to the true end of life, at which he ought to arrive pure, calm, ready to take his departure, and accommodated without compulsion to his fate. End of Book Three